there's 160 different currencies, roughly speaking, and each one is is basically a currency monopoly, um, and they use a centralized ledger. And if you happen to be born in one of these countries, uh, which is where the majority of people are, um, your wages and your savings get devalued at a very rapid pace. And you know you have a lot of frictions in terms of, of, of kind of connecting with the rest of the world. In today's episode, we're delving into the intricate world of global currencies, leveraging the insightful perspectives of Lynn Alden. Amidst a backdrop of geopolitical tensions and economic uncertainty, our journey will navigate through the complexities of currency monopolies, exploring how they shape the economies of countries worldwide. The recent resilience of the global economy, despite wars, surging inflation, and significant interest rate hikes, underscores a newfound robustness, yet challenges persist. Growth forecasts for 2024 suggest a slow pace, highlighting a pressing need for sustainable development and a re-evaluation of financial systems to meet these goals. Before we proceed, let's ensure you're part of our community by hitting the subscribe button and liking this video. For example, there's roughly 40 currencies in Africa, roughly 30 currencies in Latin America. And we can imagine in the United States, if we had a currency for every state, the, all, of the, all of the frictions that we'd have. And then further imagine, not just in terms of payment frictions, but if you took out, if you were had a business in New Jersey and you took out debt in New York dollars, um, and your cash flows are denominated in, you know, New Jersey and Pennsylvania dollars, and then there's some sort of exchange rate shift. Now you have to take that all into account. You have all these kind of additional overhead to worry about in your business because you're navigating all these different currencies, and that's what a lot of businesses have to do globally. And then. It, those consumers in those countries have to deal with the fact that their that their local ledger is constantly getting debased. And so, for example, you know, I go to Egypt every year, and um, you know, my family and friends there are dealing with the Egyptian pound and the debasement that it goes through. So every year, roughly speaking, the money supply grows by twenty percent, uh, which means that uh, everybody's kind of on a very fast treadmill to try to get um, you know twenty percent wage increases. How to not get your um, Egyptian pound savings devalued by 20%. Do, does that uh, result in countries like that? Does that result in a higher consumption profile of when you make money, you spend it right away on things uh, as opposed to saving? Pretty much. It, it results in one is higher consumption, but two, it also results in kind of malinvestment of where you store your savings. So for a lot of these types of countries, their equity markets are not as attractive as, say, U.S. equity markets. And so real estate tends to be the place that they store value. Uh, and of course, the risk in that is that you can overbuild real estate. You can build ghost cities. You can build tons of empty capacity. So you're using resources mainly for the, for the idea of saving because you associate real estate with saving. But then you think, okay, if I, if I want to have a little bit of excess savings, if I have my own real estate needs met and I don't particularly trust the stock market in my country for, for fairly good reasons, what else can I do if I, if I want to save a little bit more? It might be get a second property. And if everybody does that, or if a lot, if a big percentage of people do that, you end up with overbuilding kind of empty properties, or building too quickly, and then having them sit idle for a long time until the population expands into them, and it's not the most efficient use of of resources. Um, China went through a similar thing, which is that you know there's there's um, a lot of interest in having second, third, fourth condos, for example, as a as a method of savings, um, especially with debt attached to it. And then you get a, a property bubble, you get high valuations, you get a lot of um, debt attached to that. And some of that is largely because of, you know, people don't want to store in the currency. They want to store in something else. And so, yeah, in Egypt, you'll, you'll tend to see a lot of these kind of empty properties because that's that's what people are using as their savings vehicle. Um, you also see, um, you know, there will be black markets in dollars. Uh, there will be um, gold, interest in gold and jewelry and things like that. So it either comes in the form of not saving for the future and consuming or saving things that are maybe not the most optimal things to save in uh, and that they actually have kind of a negative externality by people saving in them. And then to... Uh, Kind of the second part of the question is uh, when we look at developed countries, I would say the problem is it's less acute than we see in developing countries, 
but it's kind of the same thing and just the magnitudes turned down. So for example, in the United States, um, our currency is debasing, but not as obviously or not as quickly as you're seeing in other countries. And so people are doing a similar thing. They're monetizing the S&P 500. They're monetizing real estate to varying degrees. They say, I don't want to store too many dollars. I want to store it in these other things. But that does have some negative externalities to it. So for example, if everybody stores their value in large cap stocks, those stocks get a monetization premium, and then they can go out and issue more shares uh, and they can go out and buy smaller companies or displace smaller companies, for example. Or, for example, if we bid up the price of real estate and we buy second and third homes, uh, it makes the cost of affording a home uh, more challenging for someone who just wants the home for their, their shelter, that they actually want it for its utility purpose. And so monetizing things of utility tends to have those negative consequences. And the, the main difference between developing countries and developed countries is mostly about the magnitude uh, or the kind of the obviousness and the acuteness of the problem. Transitioning into the heart of our discussion, Lynn Alden's insights bring to light the practical challenges faced by economies due to the fragmentation of currencies, particularly in regions like Africa and Latin America. This fragmentation adds significant complexity to conducting business and preserving wealth in an environment of fluctuating exchange rates and currency debasement. Such economic dynamics are not isolated challenges, but are intertwined with broader global risks, including geopolitical tensions, the economic slowdown in China, and surging financial stress. These factors collectively influence the global financial landscape, affecting investment, economic growth, and the overall stability of global markets. The, the current incentive structure basically makes people play a game of blackjack with the system, which is that you know in blackjack, you want to get up to 21, but you don't want to go over. And in the current fiat system, there's a strong incentive to take on leverage, uh, but not so much that you go over, that you blow up in a recession, right? So the kind of the incentive structure is um, get close to the source of money creation, take out leverage at low interest rates, short the currency, and buy scarcer assets with it. Um, and then what, what complicates it is it's a global game. So again, 160 different currencies. And so if you're, if you're kind of near the source or near the top of the system, you have all these different levers you can pull. You can like short this currency over here and buy real assets over there. And, and there's a lot of value to be gained from that arbitrage which is for the most part not really adding value, uh, but it's, it's kind of siphoning value off the top. And on the other hand, if you're farther from the source of money creation, if you're lower in that kind of money pyramid and you're primarily trying to work for a living, you're saving in the currency that other people are shorting uh, and you're earning your wages in currency that other people are shorting. Even in, even in like a hard money system, obviously um, larger and safer entities are going to have lower costs of debt, and that's a, that's a strategic advantage. But the, the, the current system really amplifies that gap because one of, the, one of the key sources of wealth creation has basically been to short fiat currencies in various ways and, and buy scarcer assets with them. Even the entire kind of multi-decade um, kind of private equity industry is larger, more connected entities with lower cost of financing being able to go out and kind of accumulate and restructure smaller businesses. And so I think that what, what this system does is, is kind of this global arbitrage just kind of increases that gap because there's so much of it that is the financial side more so than just the, the real asset side. So, so let's um, get into energy uh, a bit. Um, how, how do you think the global oil production decline rates and kind of what's coming in coming decades will affect the leverage and the financial story that you just unpacked? In other words, how are the, the price of money and the price of energy linked uh, in, a, in a leveraged fiat system? So partially where they're linked is that the money system itself is this structurally inflationary system. So the number of money units keeps going up, the, the, amount of, the number of debt units keeps going up. And by its design, it almost has to. Uh, that's kind of the, the structure of the system. It for, has For those, the last 50 years or so, right? But be, be, yeah. Before the 1960s, I, don't, I think it was a coin yeah. flip whether it would go up or down. But since then, yeah. yes, every single year. Yeah, the way it's been structured. And so... Um, so that obviously conflicts with a, a more finite resource base. And the way that shows up is that, um, you know, if you look at, say, for example, 
annual money supply growth in the United States is something like 7% per year on average. Obviously, it was higher during the, the pandemic years. Lately, it's been in, in, in kind of a period of contraction. But over a multi-decade period going back to, say, the 1960s, it's averaged about 7%. Is that just um, physical bills or is that the, the broader uh – Metrics. It's broad, broad money supply. So all the things that we, you know, our bank accounts, our our physical bills, all, all the things that we kind of count as money, um, that that general number is going up by about seven percent a year. Uh, in developing countries, it'll be generally higher. So it'll be you know ten, fifteen, twenty percent, sometimes more depending on the country. Um, and so that's this like it, like structurally inflationary backdrop, but then it's partially offset by technological and energy deflation to varying degrees. So for example, uh, it, it's way easier to manufacture a computer of a certain uh, set of specifications now than it was 5, 10, 20 years ago. And so, you know, we've gotten better at um, manufacturing, plastic toys, uh, anything that's kind of industrialized, anything electronic based. Lynn Alden eloquently compares the financial system to a game of blackjack, where strategic leverage is key. This analogy is especially poignant in today's climate, where global economies are navigating a precarious balance of inflation and growth amidst declining energy prices and technological advancements. The global economy's future is fraught with both short-term and long-term risks. From misinformation and disinformation to climate-related threats, these challenges necessitate a strategic reevaluation of how we save, invest, and plan for the future. As we conclude today's episode, we invite you to reflect on these insights and consider their implications for your financial strategies and perspectives on global economic developments. Thank you for joining us at Unscripted Crypto. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and share your thoughts in the comments below. Together, let's continue to unravel the complexities of our financial world, fostering a more informed and engaged community.